So one of the things that you grapple with in the book is um, the the ethical, the political implications of the fact that at least initially we're not expecting everyone to make use of this technology. Some people are, maybe a handful of people are already making use of it. Possibly very soon this is going to be become more common among people who have the resources to access it, but there's always going to be a degree of um, inequality of access. How do you think how do you think we should think about that? Should that should that um, put us off the idea of using it at all, or do you think there's a way of managing that inequality? Yeah, good question. So, first of all, um, there already is quite a bit of genetic inequality in the mating market. There's a sort of mating, and as you as you know, um, you know, doctors marry lawyers, and genders marry plumbers. Nothing wrong with any of those categories of people. Um, but that's a fact. And the more we've stressed female education, um, and female ownership of property, which of course began, you know, in your country made its way into the U S and from there to the world, um, what you get is more assortative mating. And the number one trait along which people assortatively mate is intelligence. Um, we can measure that it's pretty strong as an effect. I think it's like 0.4. I could be wrong. I think it's right around there. And so even in the absence of the genetic technologies, we're already getting increased genetic inequality across generations because of new mating patterns that only arise with a kind of industrial society. Um, but what this is going to do is initially potentially exacerbate those inequalities. I actually think the technology which is available now and is going to come online in, in a really powerful way in the next two to five years. I think that's going to initially have some effect, but very few people are going to use it because as usual, it will be more expensive and less efficacious than it will be in, let's say, 10 to 20 years. So it's going to be both more costly again, but also more useless. And so what's going to happen is the usual story of the rich basically subsidizing a product that isn't that well developed yet so that future poor people, that's not their intention, but the result is future poor people actually have a better quality uh, product at lower price. Nevertheless, in the interim, there will be more genetic inequalities. And even over the long run, there probably will be. There are a few ways that governments might address it. So China just made universal IVF free, um, and they're doing this to solve the population problem. I think countries like Israel, well, I think Israel does too. Um, Singapore, there are other countries that I'm sure will follow suit. And when this happens, it's going to make it a lot cheaper for everyone to do polygenic risk screening. Now, one problem with that, especially for some of your listeners, I, I bet, is that that means people who don't have to use IVF will probably start doing it electively simply because it's, it's free if the government makes it that way or insurance companies or Google, which also does this, right? Google encourages their employees to freeze their eggs in, in the idea that later they'll use IVF, especially if they sell their soul to Google for 20 years, you know, young women. And that makes it easier for Google to say, hey, just chill out. Don't even look for a guy. Don't worry about it. And then at 40, you know, maybe you'll use a sperm donor or find a guy. Um, I'm putting this in a way that is deliberately on the side of your audience. I know. <laughs> um, That's roughly my analysis true. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's true. I think it's... it's purely self-interested reason they're doing this. And I do think, and I worry, I share, I know your worry, that this is going to alter social norms in very bad ways. Um, so I actually think that this technology needs to be paired with a rethinking of what political societies look like and how we want to live together, how we want to reproduce. Should we be encouraging people to couple up, for example? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, and this would be sort of something on the side, but to tie this together back to your original question, there are different ways of achieving equality of access to this. One is through the aforementioned invisible hand, things get cheaper and better as markets advance. Another is through government or insurance subsidies. But as that happens, you're going to get a, a set of norms whereby people are probably pressured into doing IVF who wouldn't otherwise have done that. That may be a situation where it's in some sense bad for each 
but good for all or vice versa, depending on how people respond to these incentives. It could have an overall good result in the sense that artificial selection might, in principle, result in fewer diseases, smarter, nicer humans, whatever, right? Name the traits that you care about. Um, but at the expense of healthy relationships, or it could go the other way. Because it, it, it produces unhealthy relationships, we actually get a worse outcome. Maybe we get a crashing birth rate even more because you know people aren't marrying for love or staying together for love. They're doing it to produce a baby or something like this. I think all of these are on the table, which is why in my book, I'm not sort of expressing some kind of you know, un, unmitigated optimism toward this. I actually do support this technology to some extent with lots of reservations. Um, but I'm under no illusions um, that, for example, democracy just like produces invisible hand outcomes in the good sense of the word, right? Um, that's a kind of emergent order. And I'm under no illusions that widespread access to this stuff in the absence of changes in other social norms that probably matter more will produce a good outcome either. Uh, and the thing that really struck me reading your book and other writing on this is that um, this is coming whether or not we want it to because even if the West were to put serious limits on the use of this technology and research into it um, China isn't going to do so so it's it's coming and it's coming imminently and it might be that ethical objections to it um, might act as a bit of a sea anchor and slow down its adoption um, I mean do you see any scenario where this doesn't definitely come on the market within our lifetimes? Is there any way in which it might be restricted or might not work as well as we think it will? Or, or is this a certainty, do you think? So it's a certainty for lots of reasons. One, the technology is there. Two, I know of companies that are engaging in it now. And I think that there are stealth people already doing it now. So th this is happening. And it will happen at an accelerating pace over the next five years, like it or not. Moreover, laws against these things are not going to work. And here's why. Um, if you want to do polygenic screening, basically all you do is take traditional, you know, you do the traditional IVF and you get your embryo sequenced, which again has already been happening at a low resolution to screen out for downs and things like this. Um, all you get is like a slightly higher resolution sequencing. And let's say you live in Taiwan and a company in Israel or England wants to be able to give you genetic information or interpret it for you so that you can screen out, the laws are going to have a really hard time preventing those people from giving you that information. Not only are you legally entitled to that information in many countries, let's say you weren't, it's just very easy to transfer information. And you can say that you're transferring it for various purposes, um, whether or not those purposes are the reasons, the motives behind parents making those choices. Um, in the law, as you know, and for good reason, it's very hard to try someone for an intention. Um, now, in the case of murder, intention does matter. And we try to put together, you know, sets of evidence like, did this person have a motivation to do this or did they do it by accident? You know, is it mere manslaughter? Um, you can sometimes tease out motivations, but it's especially hard to do that when you're just given a bunch of data. And when a company gives you that data, why did you choose this or that embryo? It's going to be very hard for a government to enforce laws against having an intention to select for one reason or another. Moreover, there's big demand for it among the wealthy already and among the, the sort of well-connected in Silicon Valley. And in fact, it turns out the preferences are changing very fast. Science Magazine just published a survey uh, two or three months ago now asking Americans, whether or not they support the following three things. One is tutoring to boost their kids' chances of going to an elite university. Um, by the way, I don't, having taught at those elite universities, I don't recommend sending your kids there. They will be morally corrupted. Um, <laughs> but read, read Mencius Moldbug, read, read, read about the cathedral and, and how it works. Um, it's more of a, a way of indoctrinating future elites these days than it is of, of educating them. But anyway, um, yeah, it turns out like you can contrast uh, tutoring, spending money on tutoring to get your kids into an elite university versus embryo selection for the same underlying trait 
or gene editing. And I can tell you, the data is pretty clear. Tutoring does not work. It barely budges your SAT score for reasons that we, I think, understand, which is, you know, intelligence is mostly a genetic phenomenon, at least general intelligence. But something like 80% said they would use tutoring to boost their kids' cognitive ability and their chance to get into an elite school. And about 50% said they would use embryo selection for it. And 40% would gene edit their children to do this if it were known to be safe. Now, that's a counterfactual because it's not safe at all um, to use gene editing. But embryo selection is and will be, and that will be coming online very soon. And so I actually think that whatever people publicly pronounce, I think privately large numbers of people are going to want to use this even if governments try to make it illegal. And as you know, when demand for a good is high and governments try to restrict the supply, they make it both more dangerous to supply the good and they reward the wealthy and well-connected who can find ways of accessing that good. That increases the very inequalities that some, some of the people listening to us will want to quash, will want to solve. And so, by over-regulating it, you're going to succeed and it will be your fault for exacerbating inequalities, not the fault of the people who are saying don't over-regulate it, right? Um, because it's a predictable effect of, of these kinds of things. It happens with drugs, with the market for organs, um, et cetera. I guess we could add in something there, which is you could say the same for the market for prostitution. Making it illegal makes it both more dangerous and more likely that the wealthy and well-connected get away with it. On the other hand, it's also true that as with abortion and prostitution, having strict laws against them can lower demand a little bit. So it, it, it's not like it has no effect. Um, and maybe if you have strong enough aversions toward this market, you really wanna stigmatize it. You essentially impose the death penalty for accessing the genetic data of your children it probably would tamp down demand at least a little bit. So yeah, at a cost. <laughs>